hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, give this lecture. Um, it's an interesting topic that intersects a lot of things that uh, we deal with in OBGYN, uh, but usually deal with them separately. Um, and so uh, it's an area that I think a lot of people hopefully will have some interest in and be able to take away something useful uh, for their own practice. Um, we do have the Q&A um, uh, available. I'm gonna take a look at it. I don't have it up on my screen, but I'm gonna take a look at it at the end and I'll try to get through everybody's questions. Um, this slide should not take the full hour. Um, so we should have plenty of time for questions at the end, but please uh, don't hesitate to put them in the Q&A and I'll try to address as many as possible. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me yet, um, I am uh, relatively new to Beth Israel, still I've been here for about three months. My name is Andrew Bouchard, I usually go by Drew. Uh, I'm a GYN oncologist, member of the division, um, and delighted to be here and look forward to working with everybody who's on the call today. Let's see, why is this not thing? There we go. Um, so first of all, for disclosures for CME purposes, I have no financial interest relevant to the content of this lecture. Um, and just by way of sort of outlining what we're gonna talk about today, we'll do a little introduction and talk about cancer and pregnancy in general, um, and talk about some general uh, tenets of how we approach it, including how do we make the diagnosis of cancer in pregnancy, um, how do we think about the tools that we typically use to treat cancer and whether we can or can't do that in the context of pregnancy? Um, some, um, some information on the obstetric considerations, um, but uh, this is, should probably have been a disclaimer on my first talk. This is not a talk about managing pregnancy in the context of cancer. This is a talk about managing cancer uh, in the context of pregnancy. And so I think that the uh, reverse talk would be an excellent talk. Uh, hopefully one of our MFM colleagues uh, could give that, but um, I will be focusing on how we treat the cancer in the context of pregnancy. And so there'll be just a little bit on obstetric considerations, but certainly um, these patients are almost always managed in a multidisciplinary fashion. They benefit greatly from that collaboration from obstetric experts along with cancer experts. Um, and then uh, we're gonna spend the bulk of the time talking about uh, two gynecologic malignancies in particular that do occur with some frequency um, in, in pregnancy, both uh, cervical dysplasia and cervical cancer, um, as well as adnexal masses that arise in pregnancy and uh, ovarian cancer, which unfortunately does occasionally arise during pregnancy. Um, so just as, uh, you know, by way of introduction, pregnancies obviously that are complicated by cancer are really complex and challenging clinical situations. Um, young patients, when they're diagnosed with cancer, often it's a diagnosis that none of them are expecting. Um, they can be shocked and saddened by it. And when it occurs at a time that is, you know, society tells them it's supposed to be a happy, healthy time in their life, it can make it even more difficult. Um, uh, emotionally and socially, but it also can be more difficult medically. Um, diagnosis can be obscured somewhat. Um, there are changes in physical exam during pregnancy, congestion of the cervix that makes colposcopy more challenging at times. Um, a gravid uterus can hide an adnexal mass. Patients, particularly in their first pregnancy, may be unsure what they should be feeling and may be unsure if what they're feeling is normal or not. And that may make them hesitant to report symptoms to a provider who may recognize that they're not normal symptoms. There may also be some hesitation on the part of providers at ordering diagnostic testing, um, whether it's imaging or biopsies, there may be some fear that what the provider would normally do in a gynecologic patient may or may not be safe in an obstetric patient. But this is where I would argue that OBGYNs are uh, our patient's greatest allies, uh, as well as nurse midwives who are themselves experts in pregnancy and know what is normal in pregnancy and what is not. And so uh, if we can push through that hesitation as the patient's pregnancy providers, we can um, provide the right care to them and avoid delay in diagnosis, which is probably the biggest thing that patients are at risk for um, as regards cancer that occurs specifically during pregnancy. 
sometimes people will sort of disregard tumor markers um, completely. And, and there is some idea out there that tumor markers are entirely unreliable in the setting of pregnancy, and that's not true. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then there's the challenge that our cancer-directed therapies in the setting of pregnancy lack high-quality data. The number of randomized trials for the treatment of gynecologic cancers in pregnancy is zero. Um, and so we rely on guidelines that are derived largely from expert opinion um, to help guide our treatment and, and rely on the expertise of our teams, our specialty teams here at the medical center. And always we're trying to balance the risk of um, uh, uh, maternal risks and benefits versus fetal risks and benefits as we always do in the setting of pregnancy. So cancer in general, all types of cancer together affect about one in a thousand pregnancies. Uh, and this incidence has been slowly rising over recent decades as more women have delayed childbearing into the late third or late fourth um, uh, decade of life when cancers that typically affect adults start to be a little bit more common than they are in the very youngest part of adulthood. Uh, you can see in the table on the right that actually the most common cancers in pregnancy are not gynecologic cancers. Breast cancer uh, and lymphoma are slightly more common. Melanoma is becoming more common in young adults in the general population, and so that is also starting to become more common in the setting of pregnancy as well. But you can see on that list that both cervical cancer and ovarian cancer do occur in pregnancy with some frequency, and so it's helpful for uh, OBGYNs to be familiar with that. Um, other things to consider about um, form formulating a treatment plan, obviously this depends largely on the type of cancer, um, options for uh, treatment of thyroid cancer or melanoma or breast cancer may involve surgeries that are much lower risk than treatment of cervical cancer or treatment of ovarian cancer in the context of an ongoing pregnancy. And so the type of cancer obviously is very important. The gestational age uh, of the fetus is very important because there are opportunities in some cases to delay um, cancer treatment until postpartum period when the decision making may be simplified. And then there are um, things to consider regarding the social and ethical views of the patient when cancer is diagnosed very early in pregnancy. There are times when consideration of termination of pregnancy may be discussed with the patient and the patient's own views on that are gonna influence her treatment plan. Um, obviously, I said this before and I'll say it multiple times throughout this talk, a multidisciplinary team approach is very important. Um, this is a great uh, patient population for involvement with maternal fetal medicine because there may be a need for um, preterm pre delivery. Um, and so weighing the fetal risks and benefits is very important to have expert opinion on. Um, and then having uh, expert um, cancer specialists, whether it's a breast cancer specialist, a melanoma specialist, somebody who's familiar not only with the cancer, but is also comfortable with co-managing the patient uh, in conjunction with their um, pregnancy providers is very important. We have to weigh the risks and benefits of diagnostic and therapeutic interventions, um, as well as the risks of delaying those interventions on maternal health, because that's always the alternate is delaying, uh, and that may lead to maternal compromise. So we have to be very careful about that. And then there are things that we can do, particularly with gynecologic cancers, uh, surgeries that can be performed, uh, radiation that can be utilized post-pregnancy, um, but that may have impact on future fertility and future pregnancies. So not just this pregnancy and, and this child that the patient's trying to carry, but also their overall family planning goals have to be taken into account. So one of the things that I wanna sort of going back to a couple of slides ago when we talked about hesitation at diagnosing cancer in pregnancy, this table, I think, is a great example of the most common cancers that occur in pregnancy and all of the symptoms and evaluation techniques. All of the evaluation techniques are completely safe in pregnancy. There's nothing on this slide that you can't do to a pregnant patient with the appropriate counseling um, in terms of undue fetal harm. Um, so we as uh, OBGYNs, as people who are familiar with what is normal in pregnancy and what is not, uh, our, our duty to the patient is to recognize these symptoms that are abnormal and to be uh, not afraid to perform the evaluation or to order the evaluation, whether it's a, a breast ultrasound and a core needle biopsy, whether it's colposcopy of the cervix, 
whether it's uh, potentially a laparoscopic surgery to remove an adnexal mass, whether it's a chest X-ray and knowing whether that's safe in pregnancy or not, and counseling a patient through fear of radiation exposure from a chest X-ray, um, FNA of a thyroid, ordering that, doing all of these things um, for our patients or ordering all of these things for our patients um, is a way to avoid delay in diagnosis, which is the most serious thing that we, wanted to, that we want to avoid um, in patients who may have a cancer uh, in pregnancy. Um, so making the diagnosis, um, I know everybody does this uh, routinely anyway, but taking a thorough history, including family history um, at the initial OB visit, um, asking patients for, you know, we were all aware that for many young women, um, uh, the initial OB visit may be the first point of contact with the healthcare system in years, um, if it's her first pregnancy, uh, or if it's been years since she was pregnant before, and if she doesn't routinely go to the doctor in between pregnancies, doing uh, an appropriate physical exam, depending on the patient's age, making sure she's had a clinical breast exam or she's done or she's doing self breast exams if it's age appropriate based on guidelines, making sure her pap smear is up to date or performing one at the initial OB visit, all are key things in making sure that diagnoses are not missed. Um, avoiding delay in diagnosis is important. I'm repeating myself, but it is important. Um, imaging, we'll go through a little bit. Uh, there are many safe imaging options, including ultrasound and MRI in pregnancy. And then uh, being thoughtful and intentional about avoiding or minimizing radiation exposure by use of shielding of the abdomen and using non-radiating, non-ionizing radiation techniques like MRI or ultrasound to obtain information. And then using lab testing when indicated. Um, the uh, ACOG practice bulletin or committee opinion, excuse me, on the use of um, diagnostic imaging in uh, pregnancy um, is unequivocal that ultrasound is considered safe in pregnancy when utilized for a clear maternal or fetal benefit to obtain information. Uh, Non-contrast MRIs in the same category that's considered safe in all three trimesters of pregnancy. There's caution about the use of gadolinium-enhanced MRI. Uh, it should generally be avoided, according to ACOG, given concerns for teratogenicity in animal models and uncertainty about the time in which uh, gadolinium can recirculate in the fetal circulation, uh, or excuse me, in the amniotic fluid, and then can uh, from there be recirculated in uh, the fetal circulation potentially leading to a, a, a prolonged exposure. Um, and so ACOG recommends that gadolinium enhanced MRI should only be performed when absolutely necessary for information that cannot be obtained in another way. Um, in general, radiation generating imaging, uh, the adverse outcomes related to that are uh, dependent on dose, uh, location of the imaging relative to the gravid uterus, and the gestational age of the fetus at the time of exposure to radiation. Overall fetal doses less than five rads or uh, less than five centigrade, rads are equivalent to centigrade, um, is not usually associated with adverse outcomes. Um, there are a couple of, uh, I think, helpful tables down here at the bottom. So on the left, you have uh, estimated fetal doses of some common, um, um, X-ray-based uh, and CT-based studies that can be performed during um, pregnancy. Plain radiographs of the chest are associated with minimal fetal exposure. Even um, single view or two view abdominal X-rays may uh, generate a lower dose of radiation than what has been associated with any uh, adverse fetal outcomes. A mammogram is generally safe in pregnancy. CT of areas of the body that are distant from the uterus um, is generally safe, including head CT, as well as chest CT scan for PE with appropriate shielding. Uh, abdomen pelvis CT scan does um, generate uh, significantly more radiation to the gravid uterus than other uh, more distant forms of CT. But again, a single abdomen pelvis CT scan is probably going to, by estimate, generate less than five rads or less than five centigrade to the fetus, which is probably not associated with any malformations or um, decrease in uh, intelligence scores um, after birth. Um, there is some, uh, sort of in contrast to this, there's some increased risk of childhood cancer with exposures as low as um, one rads uh, in, 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 as reported affecting every two to three out of 1,000 exposed pregnancies, so still really rare, um, but theoretically a uh, potential concern for patients. 
Um, the effect of gestational age was captured nicely in the table on the right, table two, where uh, the effects of radiation in the very first two weeks of um, pregnancy after fertilization are an all or none effect. Um, either the pregnancy will go on and be uh, unaffected or um, miscarriage may occur. During organogenesis, this is a very high risk time when uh, significant congenital anomalies can occur, um, but with an estimated uh, threshold dose of about 20 centigrade. So these are, again, these the radiation, unfortunately, is measured in a lot of different units in these different tables. So RADS is equivalent to a centigrade, which is equivalent to about 10 milligray. So about 20 RADS um, could uh, lead to major congenital anomalies in the first trimester. Um, later, after uh, organogenesis is complete, um, doses of radiation may lead to um, intellectual deficits, microcephaly, and intellectual disability. Um, and so in general, we certainly do recommend avoiding radiation directly to the uterus for these reasons, but um, the doses required are well above the doses administered or uh, the exposure levels for our common diagnostic imaging tests when they're indicated. Um, serum markers, I mentioned a little bit ago that a lot of people um, sort of write off serum tumor markers and say, oh, I didn't check a CA125 because they're all elevated in pregnancy and they're all unreliable. Um, and I would caution folks on this call that that's not universally true um, and that we want to be a little bit more discerning than that. So CA125 is elevated in the first trimester, but then generally returns to normal uh, and is not markedly elevated in the second or third trimester. And so in the context of a um, uh, significantly abnormal appearing at nexal mass, it's not unreasonable to obtain a CA-125 and to utilize that information in trying to decide triage your level of concern for malignancy within the mass. Um, HCG is obviously, uh, you know, not, not normal, quote unquote, during pregnancy. Alpha fetal protein also peaks um, at the end of the first trimester and is elevated in pregnancy. LDH really doesn't change very much um, in, uh, in pregnancy. Inhibin may be increased with preeclampsia, but is otherwise fairly normal in pregnancy. Um, CEA is not changed. We, uh, we get that a lot. Obviously, CEA and CA199 are two of the markers for epithelial ovarian cancers that we often check with CA125. All three of them after the first trimester can be checked um, and can be, um, sorry. Um, can be uh, incorporated into treatment planning for patients who have an adnexal mass, which we'll talk about again a little later. So cancer treatments uh, in the context of pregnancy in general. Um, so surgery um, that is uh, urgent and or emergent, including potential diagnostic procedures for a potential cancer that needs to be diagnosed um, should not be delayed. That's consistent with the ACOG advice. Um, adverse reactions for surgery, the most serious is miscarriage, which can occur in the first or early second trimester, uh, as well as preterm labor and prematurity, which can occur in the third trimester. Uh, ACOG is clear that there's no convincing data for increased risk of genital malformation with anesthesia in the first trimester, but there may be an increased risk of miscarriage with anesthesia administered in the first trimester. In general, we advise patients who need surgery who may have the opportunity for an urgent surgery that's, that can be scheduled within a period of two to four weeks. If we can push them into the second trimester or if we can get it done before they're out of the second trimester, that's the optimal time. Um, when feasible, laparoscopy is preferred in the setting of pregnancy. It's associated with fewer preterm contractions. And uh, there are lots of other perioperative health benefits that OBGYNs know comparing laparoscopy to laparotomy. Um, the Society for uh, American GI and Endoscopic Surgeons, who are not OBGYNs, but who do a lot of abdominal surgery, um, have their own guidelines for non-obstetric surgery during pregnancy, and they recommend the laparoscopy is safe, but they do point out that Hassan entry is their preferred approach. Um, and so, uh, you know, ACOG doesn't take a stand on whether you should do an open uh, approach to establishing pneumoperitoneum for laparoscopy or do the various closed technique, but just something to think about where is the fundus if you're going to stick the varus needle in. Um, if you are going to do laparoscopy beyond fetal viability at 23 to 24 weeks, uh, you need to have um, 
uh, maternal fetal medicine and potentially NICU on board, depending on how uh, strongly you suspect that the procedure you're doing may trigger preterm labor um, and consider fetal monitoring, whether or not steroids may be indicated and what the delivery plan would be if there were signs of fetal distress. Um, Radiation therapy. Um, so there are reports of successful use of radiation therapy for breast cancer and lymphoma uh, in the context of pregnancy with proper shielding. Again, we're looking to reduce fetal exposure to less than 10 centigrade or less than 10 rads. Um, therapeutic radiation to the abdomen or pelvis is really contraindicated if you're not planning termination of pregnancy. Um, therapeutic doses to the pelvis uh, start at 4,500 centigrade, so 4,500 rads, way above all of the thresholds for fetal toxicity. And if you are creating a treatment plan where uh, the uterus is going to receive a therapeutic dose of radiation, uh, that pregnancy will not continue. And so the providers and the patient need to be aware that that is going to be the outcome uh, and to plan for it if radiation is going to be used. But it can be used outside of the abdomen and pelvis uh, with appropriate shielding in the hands of radiation oncologists who are familiar with how to do that safely. Uh, chemotherapy, the majority of agents can cross the placenta, uh, and the effects of chemotherapy are usually inversely related to gestational age. The earlier the pregnancy, the more severe the effects of chemotherapy can be. There are risks of major fetal anomalies when chemotherapy is given in the first trimester, and so in general, for all cancer types where chemotherapy is indicated, we usually try to delay chemotherapy until the second trimester in the completion of organogenesis. Um, patients who are exposed or fetuses who are exposed to chemotherapy in the second trimester do not have anomaly rates above the baseline population rate. And so second trimester, again, is a relatively safe time in pregnancy to initiate systemic chemotherapy if it's needed for a cancer diagnosis. And in the third trimester, some of the most important things are about timing of the treatment uh, as related to the delivery of the, of the infant, um, wanting to avoid effects, particularly of myelosuppression, uh, at the time of delivery, because there can be both, both maternal and neonatal consequences uh, for that. Um, combination therapy is uh, associated with a slightly increased risk of adverse outcomes compared to single agent therapy, but it also, in many cases where it's indicated, may be um, associated with increased efficacy. So again, it's an individualized uh, risk benefit decision uh, to be made by a uh, patient and the treating oncologist and the pregnancy specialist. Um, Again, similar to the effects of radiation in very early pregnancy, if chemotherapy is given um, without recognizing that a pregnancy is, is uh, present, basically if a patient has a positive pregnancy test maybe you know, a week or so after she receives a, a dose of chemotherapy, there's essentially going to be an all or nothing phenomenon. Either the pregnancy will miscarry or uh, normal development is expected. Um, uh, chemotherapy, again, given during organogenesis may lead to spontaneous abortion, but certainly there is a significant risk of major congenital anomalies like we talked about. And in the second and third trimester, there are some concerns for intrauterine growth uh, restriction and maturation concerns. Um, there is uh, more subtle ongoing development of the um, central nervous system, the gonads, uh, and some of the um, sensory organs. And so um, there are some theoretical defects uh, or, or minor anomalies that can occur. Um, and uh, the rates of these are things that need to be discussed with um, a general fetal medicine specialist and the treating oncologist to decide for each patient whether they're gonna take um, chemotherapy or potentially if something is diagnosed in the third trimester, they may elect to delay systemic treatment until after their delivery, depending on how far away that is. Um, this is a sort of an old chart, an old graphic, but it's still a nice one that kind of um, lists the individual uh, uh, organs that are developing at different weeks, uh, mainly in the embryonic period in the first weeks three through uh, eight and uh, nine. Um, everything from neural tube defects that can occur with disruptions at the third, fourth, or fifth week to more um, uh, cognitive disabilities with uh, insults at the end of embryogenesis, uh, heart defects that can occur in weeks four through six with uh, interruption in normal development, um, cleft lip, uh, uh, teeth and cleft palate, um, and then issues with external genitalia, which can continue on into later periods. <clears throat> 
Um, the teratogenic and abortive potential of chemotherapy agents. Um, there are some things that are known about specific compounds, the older alkylators like cyclophosphamide or some of the most teratogenic, as well as the antimetabolites like methotrexate, um, anthracyclines like doxorubicin, which is frequently used in breast cancer, as well as 5-FU are, are some of the least teratogenic and the best studied, um, because again, unfortunately, breast cancer is one of the most common cancers, both in general, as well as in the context of pregnancy. Taxanes and platinum compounds, which are the workhorses for our gynecologic cancers, do appear to be relatively safe beyond the first trimester, so when they're initiated in the second trimester or later. Um, and there's relatively little data for our commonly used later line chemotherapy agents for gynecologic cancers, which include pemetrexid and gemcitabine for ovarian cancer, so, as well as venerelbine for cervical cancer and oxaliplatin. Um, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors should be deferred until after delivery, so it's sort of the opposite of what we think about in, in non-pregnant patients, we often think about chemotherapy and radiation therapy as the most toxic in the non-pregnant -patient, patients. And then um, endocrine therapy in breast cancer patients is usually sort of the, the quote, easy part with uh, relatively well-tolerated drugs uh, with relatively low risks and side effects. But in the context of pregnancy, it's actually the inverse. These are the drugs that we least want to give to pregnant patients. We'd rather give them surgery or chemotherapy um, from a fetal uh, risk standpoint. Um, for fetuses, for children born uh, to women who uh, were given chemotherapy while the children were in utero, um, one of the largest studies is a little bit older now. Um, in 2001, it was published. 84 children were followed for their entire childhood for a median of 19 years uh, for mothers who were treated for lymphoma. All 84 children had normal physical, neurological, sexual, and psychological development, and they did not detect any risk for secondary malignancy in childhood. Um, they also surveyed caregivers of 57 children exposed in utero to chemotherapy for breast cancer, um, and those children were followed for anywhere from two months to 13 years, uh, and most of the children had normal development. There was one child with ADHD and one child with Down syndrome. Um, and those were not thought to be statistically significantly different from general populations based on the demographics in that study. So obstetrical considerations of primary obstetrical during cancer treatment should be to limit iatrogenic prematurity. Once you know the patient has cancer, we wanna to work together with their cancer specialist and their pregnancy specialist to provide the appropriate cancer to the, to the appropriate treatment for the patient's cancer um, without unduly um, ending the pregnancy early so that she can be treated as a non-pregnant patient. Um, neonatal outcomes are obviously very heavily dependent on the gestational age at the time of delivery. And so um, delaying delivery um, as long as it's feasibly safe uh, in close consultation with maternal fetal medicine and potentially pediatrics um, is the best um, option for many of these patients. In terms of how to deliver patients in general, delivery should be per the usual obstetric indications with antenatal steroids considered at the appropriate gestational age. There's one important caveat to that, which we'll talk about later, uh, is related to cervical cancer, but in general, um, delivery would be vaginal or cesarean per usual obstetric indications. So diving into, uh, it's just about 5.30, so we really want to get into the GYN part. So we'll talk first about cervical dysplasia and cancer. Cervical dysplasia obviously is very common uh, in pregnant patients, and I'm sure that all the OBGYN providers uh, see this in their practice over time. Uh, it affects up to 5% of all pregnancies, um, and progression to invasive carcinoma, thankfully, is very rare, uh, given that these patients are followed for a fairly short period of time. Nine months is not that long of a period of time. Uh, relative to how long we think invasive cervical cancer takes to form, um, then there is often spontaneous regression of CIN2 and sometimes CIN3 um, in the course of pregnancy. And so um, sometimes it can be appropriate uh, in, the, in patients in whom you do not have a strong suspicion for invasive disease to just kind of sit on your hands and watch patients through their pregnancy. Low-grade lesions often regress or remain stable throughout pregnancy. Um, and as we'll talk about, often don't need treatment. So it used to be just like a really clear general rule of thumb that if you diagnosed age cell or anything that you thought was non-invasive, you just did cold blows every trimester, and that was easy to remember. Um, and just like everything else that the 2019 ASCCP guidelines did, they made it horribly more complicated um, in some ways. Uh, I, I really struggle with these guidelines and the rationale behind them. They 
moved everything to risk-based screening, which uh, is not very well defined in the guidelines who is at what level of risk. But um, they did address pregnant patients as a special population, and they were very clear that the clinical action thresholds for screening and for colposcopy are not different in pregnancy. So if a patient has a pap smear result that would trigger a colposcopy in a non-pregnant patient, they should have colposcopy if they're pregnant. Cervical biopsies are fine to do in pregnancy. They're not associated with an increased risk of miscarriage. However, ECCs, endometrial biopsies, and treatment without biopsy are contraindicated. For anybody on the call who hasn't spent a lot of time going through the 2019 guidelines, one of the important updates was that for patients who are at high risk for um, CIN3 based on perhaps a HBB16 infection and an HCL pap smear, it is permissible to skip colposcopy and do treatment without biopsy in those very highest risk patients. Um, but in the pregnant patient population, the uh, experts who participated in the, in the formation of these guidelines are clear that that's contraindicated um, because there are higher risks associated with uh, excisional procedures, obviously, than just biopsy. So um, having said that, if there is a significant concern for cancer, you put in the speculum and there's a gross lesion and you're very worried that it's cancer, um, you can perform a diagnostic excisional procedure, uh, namely a leap in most cases. A repeat biopsy may be considered if the lesion is visible and you can get a good biopsy with a tischler and you can document that there's an invasion, you may not need to perform an excisional procedure before involving an oncologist to, to um, consider further staging of the cancer. Um, patients who have non-invasive disease, CIN3 or HSO, should be followed with colposcopy every 12 to 24 weeks. And they do emphasize that colposcopy with an experienced provider uh, is preferable if possible. Um, there are uh, natural changes in the appearance of the, of the cervix in pregnancy that can make uh, the cervix appear more congested and can make uh, colposcopy somewhat more challenging for people who do it infrequently. Um, but uh, the timing should be every 12 to 24 weeks. So basically one to two additional colposcopies if you have a CIN3 colposcopic biopsy uh, in the first trimester. And uh, they recommend always to repeat the biopsy if you um, suspect invasion or if the lesion appears to worsen, uh, you wanna go ahead and get a biopsy to make sure you're identifying invasive cancer. And if you have a pap smear or a biopsy that shows adenocarcinoma in situ, they recommend referral to GM oncology for consideration of uh, further workup and treatment. Postpartum follow-up at six weeks, you can consider treatment uh, of a visible lesion or repeat colposcopic evaluation. Um, and one of the things that they were really clear in these guidelines about is that they were taking into account some of the social determinants, including insurance access. So um, the statistic they cited was that 11% of pregnant patients lose insurance after their postpartum period ends. And so their threshold for excision for a visible abnormal lesion um, at the six week postpartum visit sort of takes that into account. If you think that the patient may uh, lose her insurance and you have a uh, high concern for CIN3, you may do a CN treat essentially at the postpartum visit rather than doing colposcopy and booking the patient to come back for a leap at a time point after her insurance has lapsed and then she won't be able to have the excisional treatment procedure. Um, so cervical cancer itself, thankfully, is much more rare. It affects about one uh, to one and a half in 10,000 births. Um, one to 3% of women who are diagnosed with cervical cancer are pregnant or immediately postpartum at the time of their diagnosis. About half of the women who are diagnosed peripartum are diagnosed prenatally. The others are diagnosed within the first year of postpartum follow-up. Most are diagnosed at an early stage discovered through routine care. And stage for stage, the course and prognosis of their cervical cancer is the same as for non-pregnant patients. So uh, an older study here by Neil Sood uh, looked at 26 patients who had cervical cancer that was treated with radiation therapy. So these were patients treated for locally advanced uh, cancer matched with controls, and there was no statistically significant uh, difference in recurrence or survival uh, in patients whose radiation was interrupted for three days only or less. So how do you make the diagnosis? So conization in pregnancy uh, is permissible. Um, in, the, in expert hands. The purpose is to confirm and or stage microinvasive early disease such as 1A1 or 1A2 disease. Uh, 
the optimal time for the procedure is between 12 and 20 weeks of pregnancy. This is a somewhat riskier procedure. So there are potential complications, including uh, excessive bleeding in five to 15% of cases. This may induce miscarriage or uh, fetal loss. Uh, and in later uh, gestational weeks may induce preterm labor or delivery. So the risks and benefits have to be carefully reviewed with the patients. In patients who have uh, larger lesions, 1B2 or higher, um, biopsy alone may be sufficient. Knowing the exact, exact depth of invasion may not change your management, so it may not be worth doing a colonization um, in the setting of pregnancy. There's a very old study of 180 women who underwent colonization in pregnancy, and the rate of fetal loss was about 5%. Uh, three of them were done uh, prior to 14 weeks, uh, and they had um, uh, one um, that was uh, lost four weeks after colonization. So even sometimes it's not just immediate loss after colonization, but it can occur later on in the pregnancy with the shortened cervix that's still healing from a coma. The uh, European Society of Medical Oncology uh, put together uh, expert opinion and published uh, an update to their uh, older guidelines. It was republished in 2019. Um, this is a great reference article for treatment of GYN cancers, specifically in pregnancy. So for cervical cancer, treatment of early stage cervical cancer, you start with colposcopy, examination, MRI, and biopsy or a flat conization, um, which is called a coin biopsy, not something that we do routinely, but basically just a, um, essentially a leap with a square electrode where you just shave off the end of the uh, cervix rather than um, doing sort of a more rounded um, excision that involves more cervical stroma. Once you have your staging, a 1A2 or a 1B1, um, based on the gestational age, you may consider doing a pelvic lymph node dissection and either doing, if the nodes are negative, a simple tracheolectomy or just delaying treatment until after delivery. If the pelvic lymph nodes are positive, unfortunately, that patient would have a stage three diagnosis now by FIGO 2018 staging guidelines. And um, it's not recommended to delay treatment um, for uh, the majority of the pregnancy in in cervical cancer when it's already metastatic. And so they do recommend counseling the patient on termination of pregnancy. Um, if, uh, if the patient declines that, you could consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, but these would be highly individualized decisions based on patient uh, preference or treatment. Um, if patients have this diagnosis later in pregnancy, that is the recommendation is either neoadjuvant chemotherapy with platinum and taxane or delayed treatment until after delivery. For larger lesions, again, you can sort of follow the algorithm. When nodes are dissected and are positive, they generally recommend early in pregnancy to consider termination of pregnancy and treatment. Uh, uh, later on in pregnancy to consider neoadjuvant chemotherapy to try to control the disease, or if this is diagnosed very late in pregnancy or close to a gestational age at which the fetal outcomes are acceptable, potentially just delaying treatment until after delivery. And again, for larger lesions, neoadjuvant chemo or uh, termination of pregnancy or uh, delay treatment until after delivery if the diagnosis is made later. So uh, radiation therapy is the standard of care for locally advanced cervical cancer. Um, and it's just very important that uh, all the parties involved, most importantly the patient, understand that if that is the treatment plan that were chosen for a cervical cancer, that the pregnancy would not continue. Um, and so if the goal of the patient is to continue the pregnancy, this is not an option. Um, the fetal effects can include a spontaneous abortion or an IUFD. Um, if the fetus is uh, not aborted, uh, but is, uh, uh, continues to grow after this level of radiation exposure, there's significant concern for teratogenesis and subsequent cancers in the neonate. Um, so uh, again, this can be offered, and it is the standard of care in non-pregnant patients, but it will result in fetal demise, and fetal evacuation may be needed. If it doesn't result in a uh, spontaneous miscarriage, or if there's a large tumor that's uh, obscuring delivery of the pregnancy contents uh, through the cervix, then uh, there are cases where um, a hysterotomy may be made for uterine evacuation, um, either prior to commencing with the um, radiation treatment or after IFD has occurred. Um, in patients who want to preserve the pregnancy and continue to remain pregnant, um, as I mentioned, 
new adjuvant chemotherapy can be offered, uh, and the platinum and taxane drugs remain the standard of care. Um, you can consider delivery at fetal lung maturity, and this is an important opportunity to have multidisciplinary involvement with MFM colleagues. And then um, in cases where uh, the disease has shrunk to the point where radical hysterectomy can be considered, you can consider that uh, at delivery or within six weeks postpartum. In patients who are trying to have a subsequent pregnancy, there are case reports of radical tracheolectomy um, at the time of cesarean delivery or soon thereafter. Um, those are uh, um, uncommon procedures. Uh, and so you wanna make sure that those are done by people who have uh, sufficient expertise in radical tracheolectomy even in the non-pregnant setting. Delivery planning, so this is the one caveat to sort of deliver them by obstetric indication only. Patients who undergo a vaginal delivery in the setting of microscopic cervical cancer do not have an alteration in their prognosis, but patients who have gross tumor in the cervix have worse outcomes with vaginal delivery. There's an increased risk of hemorrhage and labor dystocia, and there's a significant concern for episiotomy site or obstetrical laceration, spontaneous laceration, metastasis, and recurrence. Um, so another older paper by Neil Sood looked at patients who had a cesarean delivery who had a 14% rate of recurrence versus patients who had a vaginal delivery who had a 56% rate of recurrence that was statistically significantly different even in a small sample um, after they had a vaginal delivery. And that's been looked at in some other small case series with alarmingly high rates. So for patients who do have a gross tumor, we do recommend a cesarean delivery. Um, Let's see how we're doing on time. So, okay, good. We've got about 15 minutes left. So, and nexal masses and ovarian cancer, we'll sort of turn to this and then we'll go back to questions about any and all of the above. Um, and nexal masses are, uh, I remember the two to five rule. So, nexal masses are present in about two to five percent of pregnancies, um, and about two to five percent of those masses are malignant. Um, this was summarized again nicely in a really nice review that came out in GYN Oncology about two years ago in 2020. Um, most adnexal masses identified in pregnant women are small, simple cysts, and most of those are functional and do not require any follow-up. Um, and about 70% of complex adnexal masses, which technically would include a corpus luteum, uh, resolve uh, within the first trimester. Uh, there's a nice um, uh, study of 470 pregnant women um, who had masses uh, that were complex, and they looked at both risk of malignancy and risk of torsion, both of which are significant concerns for pregnant patients. Uh, masses six to 10 centimeters are three times more likely to undergo torsion than masses smaller than six centimeters. They found that masses that are greater than 15 centimeters in a pregnant patient had a 12-fold higher risk of malignancy compared to less than six centimeters. Um, whereas uh, masses that were moderately enlarged, so the six to 15 centimeter category, were not more likely to be uh, malignant than masses that were less than six centimeters. So the size cutoff in pregnancy for increased risk of malignancy may be more appropriate to set at 15 centimeters compared to sort of the general ACOG rule of a mass greater than 10 centimeters has an increased risk of malignancy that um, persists in the ACOG practice bulletins. Um, if patients have an adnexal mass that's expectantly managed during their pregnancy, they should be counseled on the risk of torsion, which is about 10%, the risk of rupture, which is about 2%, and the risk of undiagnosed malignancy, which is somewhere between 1% and 9% based on uh, best estimates. Um, so algorithm for management of adnexal, adnexal uh, masses in pregnancy. You want to repeat their ultrasound uh, examination at around 16 to 18 weeks gestation, so when they're in the second trimester. If it's resolved, they get triaged back to routine obstetric care. Uh, if it's persistent uh, and symptomatic, uh, they may need to go for diagnostic laparoscopy for not only diagnosis, but for uh, alleviating their symptoms. And as we talked about earlier, laparoscopic procedures in the second trimester, so around you know, 15 to 18 weeks, are generally considered to be safe, both from an anesthetic and a surgical standpoint. Um, outcomes, obviously, after laparoscopy, you then have pathologic diagnosis, and so uh, if these were benign, um, you may, if you, or if you think it's benign preoperatively, you may be able to perform a cystectomy. Um, my own experience of doing the adnexal masses in pregnancy is that cystectomy can be somewhat uh, technically difficult in the setting of pregnancy, that the ovarian tissue in the past when I've done this tends to be uh, very um, friable and uh, soft with the hormonal changes of pregnancy, just like the uterus is sort of softened in pregnancy. And cystectomy is not always technically feasible, and sometimes you do have to still do an uh, adnexectomy. Um, 
depending on how adherent, what type of cyst it is and how adherent it is to the capsule, which has been stretched. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, borderline and malignant lesions uh, in a minute. So ovarian cancer in pregnancy, uh, while it's rare, um, the, uh, it certainly does occur. And uh, about half of all ovarian malignancies that occur in pregnancy are epithelial. So this is a lower percentage than in general, about 80% um, of uh, ovarian cancer in the adult population is epithelial and um, stromal and, and germ cells make up less than about 15 to 20% or less of uh, uh, um, malignant ovarian tumors in adults in the general population, um, but germ cells are uh, overrepresented in pregnant patients because pregnancy is occurring primarily uh, in younger patients in whom germ cell tumors are more common. So epithelial tumors, uh, as I said, are about half of ovarian malignancies. About half of these epithelial tumors are borderline tumors, and half are actually invasive high-grade carcinomas. And the most common epithelial ovarian cancer type in pregnancy is still the same as our non-pregnant population, which is high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Among the germ cell tumors that account for about a third of, of ovarian malignancies in pregnancy, just germinomas are the most common. So the diagnosis is made with imaging. Many of our pregnant patients are undergoing routine ultrasound and they may pick up adnexal masses. Uh, careful physical exam in uh, first trimester may also detect an adnexal mass, but later in pregnancy, uh, as I think most of the folks here know, it's uh, pretty uh, challenging to detect uh, a small to medium-sized uh, adnexal mass uh, with a gravid uterus in the way. Again, um, I want to reemphasize that tumor markers may actually be reliable and should not be totally disregarded depending on the gestational age. Uh, this is another summary um, from this paper, this review paper by Karanaga um, two years ago. Um, CA125 is elevated really only in the first trimester. So later than that, it can be a useful indicator uh, when it's elevated that there may be something going on. CEA um, can be um, can rise in the third trimester, but in general still remains close to normal. So if you have a mark of the elevated CEA, um, that should be considered abnormal. Uh, AFP uh, peaks at 13 weeks, but then should fall. And so if you have a complex mass in the third trimester and a very elevated AFP, you do want to think about potentially an immature teratoma or a mixed germ cell tumor, the oak sac tumor. LDH may be elevated with preeclampsia, but outside of the setting of preeclampsia, um, uh, of very high LDH may be indicative that this adnexal mass could be a um, dysterminoma. And then inhibin A uh, for granulosa cell tumors is predominantly elevated in the setting of preeclampsia, but inhibin B uh, is a little bit more specific. And then HCG obviously uh, uh, peaks at the end of the first trimester and then declines in the second trimester, but remains elevated throughout pregnancy. So that can be challenging to diagnose uh, primary ovarian choriocarcinoma in the setting of pregnancy. Uh, there is uh, an entity called complete hydatidiform mole with a coexisting fetus. Um, that's sort of a talk in and of itself. I'm not really going to address that um, today, um, but uh, complete hydatidiform mole um, is itself not, not technically a malignancy, but um, there are several case series suggesting that when these are followed to term with a coexisting fetus or followed to delivery with a coexisting fetus, that the rate of subsequent malignant GTN may be a lot higher, maybe 50% rather than the 20% that we normally think of for complete moles. So um, it's sort of cancer adjacent, but I'm not really going to touch on it beyond that today. Um, so surgical evaluation for adnexal masses, surgery should be deferred until the second trimester if possible. Uh, again, laparoscopy is the preferred approach. Worrisome features warranting pathology would be greater than 10 centimeters or based on the co-paper greater than 15 centimeters, um, solid and cystic areas uh, with papillary structures or septae, um, again, similar to non-pregnant patients. And surgical staging is indicated in the parent stage one lesions, um, depending on histology. So again, treatment algorithm for epithelial ovarian malignancies, uh, laparoscopy with biopsy or a USO, uh, with or without frozen section, depending on whether the person doing the operation may have the skills and the consent to go forward and do a staging procedure that day. Um, in general, for borderline tumors, the, the um, uh, ESMO guidelines actually recommend staging after delivery. Uh, I think most human oncologists would tell you, I would certainly tell you that um, omentectomy and perineal biopsies 
um, uh, at the time of laparoscopy in the second trimester confirm minimal morbidity. Um, here at Beth Israel, we don't typically do lymphadenectomy for borderline tumors because they rarely metastasize to lymph nodes. So, um, uh, you know, uh, essentially doing a fertility sparing stage in surgery at the time of a diagnosis of borderline tumor would be what we typically do here um, and is slightly different from what it says in this algorithm, but um, you wouldn't be wrong to do a complete staging after delivery if the patient um, does not wish to preserve fertility after this pregnancy. Um, invasive epithelial ovarian cancers, there's sort of two clinical scenarios, either you have disease limited to the ovary or you have evidence of extra ovarian disease. Uh, for disease limited to the ovary, if by your frozen section alone, you have indication for chemotherapy, maybe you have a high grade tumor um, or a clear cell tumor, um, you can consider staging, but uh, particularly if the pregnancy is of a gestational age where it's safe to give chemotherapy right away um, and uh, staging is not going to change whether or not the patient gets chemotherapy, you can consider just proceeding with chemotherapy. And then depending on the exact clinical scenario, you can consider staging after the delivery, whether or not the patient wants to preserve fertility um, or whether or not there may be any benefit to removing lymph nodes you know, after chemotherapy has been given is something that the GEO oncologist can discuss with the patient. Um, if it's earlier in pregnancy, again, you can consider staging. If the patient doesn't consent to it, you can move forward with um, chemotherapy or you can do both. Um, if the patient has disease limited to the ovary and the histology is such that they may not uh, need chemotherapy, um, if they're at an early gestational age, um, they do recommend that the patient undergo staging, including lymphadenectomy during the pregnancy. Um, but uh, after about 20 to 22 weeks, Comprehensive staging, including comprehensive lymphadenectomy, is very technically challenging as the uterus is uh, usually out to the pelvic sidewall, and it may be somewhat difficult, depending on the exact gestational age, to actually obtain uh, adequate staging. And so if the patient maybe could be safely delivered within a few weeks, you might uh, defer their staging until after the uterus is not gravid, and you can do a better um, nodal staging to really determine if the patient uh, has an indication for chemotherapy. And then in the, the uh, peritoneal spread category. Uh, if this patient is diagnosed with metastatic disease at a very early gestational age, um, either uh, consideration of pregnancy termination, if it's in line with the patient's wishes, or proceeding with uh, chemotherapy would be indicated. Uh, after viability, or if the patient uh, is, uh, you know, after viability, basically the, the patient would be triaged usually to neoadjuvant chemotherapy with a debulking surgery after delivery, depending on uh, the extent of the disease and whether the other uh, GYN organs are involved. Um, the goal still being an optimal cytor reduction, just like it is uh, in non-pregnant patients. Uh, chemotherapy, again, we talked about this earlier. We delay it until the second trimester if possible. The standard treatment regimen is the same, paclitaxel and carboplatin. Uh, same issues as noted earlier with respect to fetal teratogenicity. We try to avoid the first trimester. Uh, we try to avoid this within three weeks of delivery due to risks of maternal and neonatal myelosuppression. Um, we don't want the mother to be thrombocytopenic or neutropenic at the time of the vaginal delivery. And the neonatal clearance of these drugs through um, hepatic and renal metabolism is less efficient than placental metabolism. And so we would like the uh, fetus to have cleared all the drug before the neonate is delivered and has to rely on their own clearance mechanisms. And the WHO does contraindicate breastfeeding um, while patients are actively receiving chemotherapy based on those clearance risks for the neonate. Uh, for germ cell tumors, a very similar uh, approach, um, laparoscopy, uh, removal, USO. Um, and then uh, for germ cell tumors, if there's an indication for chemotherapy, you can consider giving it during pregnancy. Um, the guidelines here uh, actually do indicate that after the first trimester, BEP is considered safe, according to the European Society of Medical Oncology. I don't know that that view is completely shared in the United States. There are some concerns about secondary malignancy in fetuses exposed to uh, etoposide, but those are rare case reports, and so it's definitely controversial and something that the patient needs to discuss with their oncologist. Um, if the germ cell tumor is early stage uh, and the patient would be observed, then they are just observed and followed up through the uh, postpartum period and beyond. Uh, patients with sex cord stromal tumors <clears throat> who have no indication for chemotherapy can undergo staging 
uh, with or without chemotherapy uh, if the staging is positive, or they can have staging after delivery if their diagnosis is made later. And if they have metastatic sex cord stromal tumors, uh, metastatic granulosa cell tumors, they can receive chemotherapy um, in pregnancy. Um, so again, germ cell tumors, adjuvant chemotherapy recommendation is for the usual indication, um, uh, stage two and higher uh, lesions, uh, yolk sac tumors, uh, aggressive um, uh, grade three uh, immature teratomas, um, early stage dysterminomas uh, and low grade um, immature teratomas may not need chemotherapy. Uh, where possible, chemotherapy should be delayed until after the completion of the first trimester. Uh, I mentioned that uh, tofacide um, has some concerns uh, with fetal effects, potentially including fetal bone marrow suppression as well as IHGR. Um, but there are some key series of BEP in the second trimester that show no major or minor malformations, uh, so no congenital anomalies. Um, and uh, in general, whether you choose carboplatin and taxol or you choose BEP, um, you don't want to delay adjuvant chemotherapy because this may increase the risk of recurrence in what are otherwise, as a group, malignant germ cell tumors, highly curable forms of ovarian cancer for most patients. So I thought uh, I would just end with a case of a recent patient. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, I apologize for talking too much. Um, but this is a recent patient who was seen on our service uh, here at Beth Israel. She is 23 years old, uh, G4P2, presented to an outside hospital at 10 weeks for an initial OB ultrasound. She was found to have bilateral uh, ovarian masses that were complex uh, and relatively large. She was seen by GM oncology at 20 weeks. Uh, there were some social factors at play, I think, that led to a little bit of a delay between 10 and 20 weeks. Um, but as soon as she was seen by GM oncology, she was uh, ordered to have an MRI. Um, which denoted bilateral ovarian mixed cystic and solid masses measuring now 18 by 11 centimeters and 12 centimeters on the left, uh, significant solid components with cystic solid lesions um, and associated diffusion restriction. Um, and so they were uh, highly concerning for malignancy. This is a still image of the coronal plane. You have a large adnexal mass here on the right and a slightly smaller one here on the left uh, surrounding a gravid uterus. Oops. The patient uh, underwent surgery the following week. Um, she was uh, also found to have, uh, I should say, in that MRI, she was also found to have, I didn't include it here, uh, bilateral lymph nodes and uh, concern for possible disease in the omentum. Um, and so because of this, uh, because of the size of the uterus at 21 weeks, the decision was made to perform this as an open surgery. She underwent a BSO for removal of the gross disease, as well as debulking of right diaphragm tumor and left periodic nodes. Uh, the right ovary was torsed. Uh, there was no visible appearing, um, uh, normal appearing ovarian tissue, hence the bilateral subphingal refractomy. Frozen section uh, thought that this was a high grade carcinoma or potentially a yolk sac germ tumor. Um, there was a single large implant on the right diaphragm, which was resected, and the paraaortic para adenopathy was also resected. The gravid uterus was normal, and the rest of the uh, survey was normal. Um, so her pathologic diagnosis was a stage three high-grade serous ovarian cancer uh, with disease involving the omentum, both tubes and ovaries, the sidewall peritoneum, the diaphragm tumor, and the periodic lymph nodes. So the patient has been receiving uh, chemotherapy uh, here at BI. She's done very well. She received four cycles of carbotaxol at 24, 27, 30, and 33 weeks. She's been seeing MFM, had third trimester growth scans with uh, antenatal testing as ordered by MFM. And all her testing has been reassuring to date. And she is now 35 weeks with a plan for delivery in a couple of weeks. Um, so in general, uh, conclusions, patients are best served with a multidisciplinary team with an oncologist, OBGYN, pregnancy specialist, MFM, genetics, and social work for support. Termin of termination of pregnancy does not appear to improve uh, outcomes related to the disease, so patients should not feel that they have to terminate their pregnancy, depending on the specific circumstances, but that should uh, be discussed with the patient um, as various treatment plans are considered and offered depending on uh, what treatments are sort of the standard of care outside of pregnancy. Surgery in general uh, is best undertaken in the second trimester. Chemotherapy after the first trimester has a low risk of major fetal malformations. If the patient desires the, the patient's desire for the pregnancy and fears related to treatment may strongly influence the treatment plan. And so a lot of counseling and time uh, can be very helpful to make to help patients work through those um, sometimes conflicting fears and desires. 
And the overall prognosis for GYN cancers diagnosed in pregnancy is not different than in non-pregnant patients, uh, which is an important take-home point. Um, two really excellent resources that I relied on a lot sort of in putting this talk together and that include a lot of the primary data for small case series that are out there um, in specific clinical situations are the 2019 ESMO guidelines, which are available on PubMed, um, and then the review that came out two years ago in GYN Oncology um, by Karanaga um, uh, in uh, Gynoc. So I uh, am done labbing. Uh, I went a minute over. I'm very sorry for that. I'll look at the uh, question and answer. I don't see any questions popped up so far. Uh, happy to stay on for a few minutes to answer them. Uh, but I also recognize that it's uh, the evening time and I appreciate your attention so far. And um, thanks for, for coming. And I hope it was helpful. Thanks, Kate. All right, thank you to everybody um, and have a wonderful evening. And I hope to meet anybody on the call who I haven't met before uh, very soon. Take care.